the interesting work in all this material is being done as we saw in neuroscience and brain science. And um, I look at that with awe and respect and gratitude. It is not what I do, however. Um, what we've seen is people who are looking under the hood, and I have been trying to write something about what it's like to drive the car. And um, more than that also, my book is an attempt to think about places where forgetfulness is more useful than memory. So it has a kind of upbeat feel to it. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the first poems that Jane read were all kind of sad, and I was realizing that that's not the tone of my book. There's a thread of sadness in it. There is some material about loss. Um, but the project uh, of my book called The Primer for Forgetting was twofold. One was to experiment in thought, the thought experiment being to f seek out places where forgetfulness is more useful than remembering. And the formal experiment, um, I have written the book in short episodes. Uh, some entries are only a sentence long, some of them, many of them are just a page long. And I collected these in notebooks for many years and then I put them into categories. The first category uh, are things related to mythology. The second are things related to personal psychology. The third is more collective memory and forgetting. The third is called nation. And the final one are um, the topic is spiritual life and artistic practice. So I thought I would um, read you short bits from each section just to give you a, a f the flavor of this. So the mythological section, I believe in myth in the following sense. that I think the old stories give us patterns of thought and give us a vocabulary for thinking in the present moment and that they endure to the degree that these patterns of thought are still useful and provocative. Um, one of the old uh, stories is that uh, you find this in Plato, you find it in China, uh, you find it in, um, well, I'm going to read you a bit about the Trobrian Islands, uh, but it's the idea that uh, the soul knows something before it's born and that birth is a forgetting. And this seems like a great loss. You would like to <laughs> be born knowing what you knew before. But you could flip it over and say that actually this is a description of um, that forgetfulness is the precondition of birth, that to come into new life requires forgetting. Uh, so here's a little piece from, uh, from the book. Writing about the cosmology of the Trobian Islands, an anthropologist tells us that the Pro Trobrian universe is a vast disembodied space filled with both minds and energy. Cosmic minds are all seeing, all knowing, and all powerful, able to manipulate the energy of the universe toward whatever end they desire. But in spite of, or rather because of, these remarkable endowments, cosmic minds have a problem, cosmic boredom. They have the power to do anything they wish, but because they have no needs, the power has no purpose. They may be all-knowing, but to be all-knowing means there's nothing to think about. So they sit around bored to death, or rather bored to life, because, as it happens, they have invented a way to relieve cosmic boredom. It is to play the amusing game of life. To play, you must be born into a human body, and to be born as such, you must forget the fullness of what you knew and work only with what can be known through the body. A human being is someone who has abandoned the boring surfeit of knowledge so as to come alive. Oh, I'll read you one more from this section. Um, hold on if I can find it. No, I won't. Um, Actually, as I was writing the book, one thing I, I hadn't really thought of ahead of time um, was the problem of the unforgettable. So etymologically, one interesting root of the language about forgetting, in the Greek system, lethe means uh, forgetting. And we still have the river Lethe is the river that when you cross it, you forget things. And uh, one of the roots of the word lethe uh, in the Euro Indo-European system is that it has to do with being hidden. Uh, that to forget something is to hide it. So things that are forgotten are hidden in the mind. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, I teach, or I used to teach, and one forgets one's students' names, but in fact they're in there someplace. 
uh, if somebody reminds you of the name. So things can be in the mind but hidden. Uh, but then the curse is things that cannot be hidden, things that are in the mind and you can't get rid of them, you can't put them aside. And so in Greek tragedy, uh, the problem of the Furies, these uh, uh, energies uh, who harass people who have committed crimes, is that they are the embodiments of the unforgettable. Uh, they harass the mind forever. You cannot sleep when uh, the unforgettable has a hold of you. Um, so, I, again, in the mythological section of this book, I, I uh, try to address some of the ways in which one might begin to uh, deal with the unforgettable. So the second section of the book is about the self. Um, one of the key topics in the book comes out of Buddhism. There's a famous uh, lecture by Dogen Zenji, the uh, Zen master, uh, who says that when you do a meditation practice, the practice of meditation is uh, studying the self to forget the self. And if you could forget the self, well, then there's a problem of translation, how to get the next line. But if you could forget the self, the world becomes interesting again. You, be, you see the world again. Um, so it's as if uh, the self has habits of mind. There are ways in which you approach the world. And in meditation, you could begin to become conscious of your own habits of mind and maybe even make them more transparent and begin to see that there are other ways that the mind could work. So to study the self is to forget the self. And so one of the themes in the book is the problem of self-forgetfulness as a virtue, something that you might seek out. Um, so here's one little example of somebody talking about this. Reading Darwin, one admires the beautiful solid case being built up out of his heroic observations, almost unconscious or automatic. And then comes a sudden relaxation, a forgetful phase, and one feels the strangeness of his undertaking, sees the lonely young man, his eyes fixed on facts and minute details, sinking or sliding giddily off into the unknown. What one seems to want in art, in experiencing it, is the same thing that is necessary for its creation, a self-forgetful, perfectly useless concentration, says Elizabeth Bishop. And I'll do one more from this. Um, I'm interested in the dream of forgetting. We all have dreams in which we've forgotten something important. In a dream, I have forgotten to write my term paper. <laughs> I am in a seminar led by famous Professor C, and I suddenly realize that it is the end of the semester, and I have done absolutely nothing about the paper. I wake up in the usual panic. Reflecting on the dream of forgetting, I decide to honor the forgetful me. There must be a good reason he has not written that paper. He seems trapped under false obligation, able neither to do the task nor to deny it. I myself am now teaching a college class. The semester is beginning, as I have this dream, and now I feel sympathy for my students. <laughs> Years from now, will I appear in their dreams, expecting the unfinished work? I revise my syllabus, removing three of the assignments. <laughs> So the third section of the book is, is called Nation, and it's a lot of uh, the work that one can do individually around memory and forgetting doesn't scale very well. It's much more complicated to do it in groups. And uh, the, the examples I work on in, in this section, one is about what happened in Spain after the Franco died. Uh, the Spanish, they immediately instituted an amnesty law and amnesty is judicial forgetting. The law agrees to not remember your crime. You cannot be punished for a crime if you have received amnesty. Um, and there are different kinds of amnesty. And in Spain, what often happens is that the, the bad guys, when they lose power, they quickly write an amnesty law and forgive themselves of all the crimes they did. Um, and that's what happened in Spain. And Spain had a period called El, uh, El Pacto del Olvido, the Pact of Oblivion. They agreed to just not remember what had happened under Franco. And typically this lasts for one generation and the next generation begins to say, wait a minute, what happened? Um, and so I do something with Spain. Uh, 
something with the, the puzzle over, well, I do something with um, how we remember the Indian Wars in the 19th century in the United States and how we remember the Civil War. And in several cases, I end up saying this experiment in which I'm trying to find benef beneficent forgetting fails, that it's still not time to forget about this. And so I feel both in the matters of the Civil War and racial injustice in this country and also Native American material uh, that it's too early to forget. Um, though at the end I work some with um, the Truth and Reconciliation work that they did in South Africa, which is the best example we have of trying to work on a kind of, uh, what I think of as memorable amnesty in the sense that uh, there was an attempt to really remember what had happened under apartheid such that one could move on. Um, so the material in this section is actually too complicated to read, but I will, I'll read you one short thing that, um, in 1947, when Juan Paron uh, became president of Argentina, Jorge Luis Borges found himself promoted from his position in a municipal library to a post as inspector of poultry and rabbits at the Buenos Aires Municipal Market. Years later in the last interview before his death, Borges was asked if he had forgiven the Peronistas. Forgotten, not forgiven, he said. Forgetting is the only form of forgiveness. It's the only vengeance and the only punishment too. Because if my counterparts see that I'm still thinking about them, in some way I become their slave. And if I forget them, I don't. I think that forgiveness and vengeance are two words for the same substance, which is oblivion. So the last section um, is about religious and sp or spiritual and artistic practice. Um, it has a lot of material about uh, Marcel Proust and some material about um, St. Augustine and some material about Dogen Zenji again. Um, I'll just read a few sections from this. Um, what do I have here? The painter Bryce Marden, I just went to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and there's a wonderful room of Bryce Marden paintings there. The painter Bryce Marden sometimes draws with a long stick or branch dipped in ink, distancing himself from the work and deliberately interfering with his control of the stroke. Says Marden, the work starts out with observation and then automatic reaction, and then I back off, so there's a layering of different ways of drawing. It's the opposite of knowing yourself through analysis. It's more like knowing yourself by forgetting yourself learning not to be so involved with yourself. How to forget yourself, use a long stick. <laughs> in the days when I was writing about Marcel Proust, I had a dream in which I am a young Jewish boy living among Gentiles. People seem nice enough, but there is anti-Semitism in the air and I am silently making preparations to flee it seems I have with me a baby elephant that I decide to leave behind. He can fend for himself, I reckon. Though before I go, I fill a tub with water. It's for him to drink. But in fact, I cl he climbs into the tub and I set to work soaping and washing his back. I wrote this dream down in my journal, but found myself an aging Gentile, wholly unable to explain its meaning or origins. <laughs> Later that same day, I happened to revisit a website where I had recently listened to an old folk song, Keep It Clean. Suddenly I realized that a bit of my dream must have come from a fragment of that song that begins, if you want to hear that old elephant laugh, take him down to the river, wash his yes, yes, yes. Take soap and water for to keep it clean. <laughs> In the second volume of Proust's novel, young Marcel is enchanted by the early morning sight of a peasant girl walking down a line of trains, offering coffee and milk to the passengers. Musing on why the sight strikes him so directly, he notes that he had been traveling, and therefore my habits for once were missing, and all my faculties came hurrying to take their place. This is the great theme in Marcel Proust, that the habits of mind 
kind of buffer the world. And if your habits could be suspended, you'd suddenly see something. My habits for once were missing, and all my faculties came hurrying to take their place. A dream like mine implies that all our faculties are always present, always on duty, even though their gleanings don't always find their way into the watchtower brain with its spinning lights. Sometimes, however, as in this case, they make their way into the weavings of the night brain, and even assuming that they survive state transition amnesia, this is, that they survive waking up, they present themselves to the baffled morning. When I wrote out my dream, I hadn't remembered that folk song. But then again, the eye that dreams hadn't forgotten it. Remembered, forgotten, the terms are so binary. What name shall we give these little elephants of mental life? These traces of perception that are present but not present, noticed but not noticed. They're like letters received but not yet opened. Their contents available to the invisible weaver of dreams because never exposed to the domesticating force of habitual thought. Now I'll read you something from the end here. Um, Actually, I'll read a little thing that's about, th I'll read just two more things that's about the, the way the book is made. I claim no strong connection between forgetfulness and the book's episodic form, but if there is one, it most likely lies in the way that juxtaposition encourages not just free association, but free forgetting. So the book just jumps from thing to thing, and um, jumping from one thing to another, the entries decline to declare a train of thought. I realize that putting Macho Nietzsche next to Hitler's abandoned bunker, which is in the book, for example, may be thought provoking and that some readers will bridge the gap with their own transitional abstraction. Myself, I leave it alone. Interpretation too readily de declared dims the lights of things. Holding off allows the elements to glow. Readers then, as they cross the divide between any two entries, will suffer or enjoy their own level of state transition amnesia. Some entries will fade immediately, others linger in the mind, and some disappear, only to return unbidden, involuntary memory, having drawn upon its treasure chest of oblivion. The spaces between entries foreground what happens with any book we read. We retain some things as we go along, while others drop away. Finally, until out of the keepers and the discards, we extract the unique book of our own engagement. Unless we kill a book by committing it to memory, active imagination, and this is uh, Jorge Luis Borges' definition of imagination, is the combination of memory and oblivion. Active imagination will make for us the book that is our book. The episodic form acknowledges the collaged afterlife of anything we read or of any life for that matter, for we too are discontinuous creatures, scattered in time, the meaning of our existence, something we can only imagine. So the book ends, there's a um, Portuguese poet, Fernando Pessoa, and here's a little poem of Pessoa's. Rather than the flight of the bird passing and leaving no trace, Rather the flirt, <laughs> rather the flight of the bird passing and leaving no trace than creatures passing, leaving tracks on the ground. The bird goes by and forgets, which is as it should be. The creature, no longer there and so perfectly useless, shows it was there, also perfectly useless. Remembering betrays nature, because yesterday's nature is not nature. What's past is nothing and remembering is not seeing. Fly, bird, fly away. Teach me to disappear. Thank you.